Okay, so for uh, we're going to get going for all you guys that were here. Uh, well, I'll talk to the people who weren't here and who were here last week. So last week we talked about branding and uh, an archetype. So to recap for people who weren't here last time, there are really two main buckets of intelligence or research that go into making your marketing as efficient and effective as humanly possible so that you aren't just trying things, right? Everybody's experienced that. You spend money on something, you've tried it, whether it be radio or social media or something, it just didn't seem to work, right? You didn't make any sales. You didn't get a return on your investment. So there's really uh, those two buckets of research really help um, us hone in on what to do that will actually work. So that first one is all about your voice and your personality, um, your brand. It's all about figuring out who you really are of these 12 archetypes so that you communicate properly um, in your strength. Because if you are a lover and you're communicating as a, as a rebel, <laughs> it's not going to resonate with people. You're not you're not in integrity and people can pick up on that. That's number one. Number two, from a business perspective, it drives your, your messaging and your branding. And ideally, it attracts customers that either have the same archetype or appreciate that archetype, or it at least resonates with them. So now you make what I always make this dating analogy. You've got love at first sight with potential customers. That's what we really try to achieve with the marketing, with that branding piece. So today we're going to get into that, that second bucket of research, which is, which is mostly external. And we build this seminar, this webinar, as doing most of it and saving the competitive aspect of it for the third one. But I think I'm going to change it up a little bit. And um, I think I'll split this bucket of research between this seminar and the next seminar and um and maybe give a little bit of time to see if anybody has any questions about the first webinar that we did so i'm going to open it up if nobody does that's fantastic we'll just move along but i wanted to uh to open it up and see if anybody had any questions about the branding and the archetype stuff that we did last time and before i say go um let me introduce you to Martina is our, our co-host and our super awesome, Martina's our senior research analyst. She's the one that does all the research that we're about to share with you right now. Um, anybody who meets her or any of our clients or any of our coworkers just come back and go, she's awesome, don't ever lose her. So she's, <laughs> she is absolutely fantastic and she'll be piping in here um, a little bit. So I'm going to open it up. Um, I think everybody's pretty much muted. If you have a question, just unmute yourself and let us know if you got a question about that branding webinar. If you don't, we'll move on. Must have been, I must have been awesome. I must have explained it perfectly. <laughs> um, cool. So I'm going to pull up this. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and pull up the new, uh, this new piece that we're talking about here. So again, to let you know about this whole entire series is really the stuff that we're talking about last webinar, this webinar, and the next webinar. So everything with the fourth webinar is stuff that applies anytime. We're really just trying to um, show you how much more important it is in the times that we're in right now. And then that fourth one is going to get into actual specific tactics that you can employ, um, particularly if you're like one of the businesses that are getting killed by this. So like Main Street businesses. Um, I was watching the news this morning and they came up with a statistic that foot traffic has declined 98% since 
So any business, restaurants, main street businesses that rely on people walking in the door, 98% decline. So that it's crushing, obviously. So we're coming up with some stuff. We've already helped a bunch of businesses. We've been paying attention to what businesses are doing all over the country. Um, I had a conversation this morning that was very interesting that came off of a webinar I was watching that we might be partnering with a, um, a, a safety training company to come up with a certification um, that let's say a restaurant can put this certification on their door that says that they've been certified um, as safe. So like they know the protocols during this environment that we're in. So if people are going to go to a restaurant, they would feel more comfortable going to a restaurant that they know gets it. And they're not gonna walk in and have a waitress bop up to them with no mask and touch them. Um, so coming up with that certification, they're gonna come up with the certification and then we may help them brand it uh, so that they're like the good housekeeping seal of approval um, for this kind of thing. So anyway, in, into, into our presentation. So real quick about capacity marketing in general. Um, if you haven't figured it out, we are, we're research driven. Um, so we do these two buckets of research pretty much on every client that we take on that's a serious client. And that informs not only our strategy and tactics, but our design as well. So those archetypes we talked about, there are colors that go with those archetypes. There are fonts that go with those archetypes. There's tone of speaking that go with those archetypes. So everything is driven by those two buckets of research. And, and we take that very seriously. We never let people just go, oh, I got a great idea. Look at my picture, isn't it cool? We never let that happen. Um, it is always done um, with the research, driving it. We're a full service firm. We do everything from branding, video, web development, content management, traditional advertising, digital marketing. Some people say, wow, how can you be good at it when you do it all? And I love that question because if the research is driving it all, all this stuff, that's 20% of it. It's the research, it's 80% of it. Not, not to say that when somebody's producing a video, they have to be 120% <laughs> good at what they do, but the research drives it. Um, here is, I'm sure we're missing a couple people. This page keeps getting bigger and bigger, but um, this is the current team. There's Martina, my partner, Matt, who's on here. Tara, if you can see her, she's our rock star business development person. A um, bunch of our clients, just to give you a quick idea of kind of the level that we are playing at all over the place. Everything from a small Vermont company that makes syrup evaporators to Marshall and Sterling, um, Dollar General. So here we go, situational analysis. This is literally the research that Martina would do on a client, that second bucket of research. Branding is the first one, this is the second bucket. It consists of a market analysis, and we'll get in all the details on these. Narrowing down your target market, I'm gonna repeat that because if you get anything out of this particular section, it's the word with the words narrow down. <laughs> everybody thinks their market is everybody or anybody who might be interested in them. And I, I will explain why that is terrible. Um, consumer behavior, SWOT analysis, competition, which we'll probably get into on the next one, historical results and macro environment. So here we go. So this market analysis, I'm gonna try not to read to you, but this is, this is well written. This market analysis that we're talking about is the process of gathering information about a market within an industry. So if you think, if you're a restaurant, we are going to gather information about the market, people who go to restaurants in this restaurant industry. If you're insurance, then it's gonna be people who are interested in buying insurance that are gonna be interested in the insurance industry. So the analysis studies the dynamics of that market because that market changes, it's very important. Um, there could be different levels of, different ages of people think and, and act differently. 
So you can't just say restaurant goers. Everybody goes to restaurants. Okay, fine. But I'd argue with you that there's a huge tranche of people that don't go to restaurants. So that takes everybody and narrows it down already. And then within those people that do go to restaurants, there could be four to five generations. And each one of those generations think differently. You know they do because we make fun of it all the time. We make fun of boomers and we make fun of Gen X and we make fun of millennials. They clearly think different, different enough for us to make jokes about it constantly. But when we market to them and try to gain their trust and gain their interest and get them to come in and do business with us, we think they're all the same. Pretty silly, right? So um, this industry overview shows investors that you understand the larger landscape that you're competing in. So an investor could be you. We want you to understand it. And more importantly, it helps you understand there's going to be more demand or not for products in the future and how competitive that industry is likely to be. I'll give you examples as we go through. So here we go into this. It's gonna include demographics, market trends, market growth, target market, consumer behavior, and competition. So target market. You, you want to identify the people who really want or need what you're offering. Again, I'm gonna repeat that and I want you to really focus on this because if you get anything out of this target market demographic section, it's to narrow, narrow, narrow down. You want to identify people who really want or need what you're offering. Let me tell you why it's bad for you to just try to go after everybody. Number one, it's harder, number one, than, than going after the people who really want or need you. If you can just hit the people who really want you or need you, especially when they want or need you, you're so much farther ahead of the game than just getting on a mountain and saying, I have a restaurant with good food to the whole world who's like not paying attention. They're doing stuff. They don't care. They're not hungry, right? So I'm using a restaurant because this is easy for everybody to understand. You, you never want to do that. Um, I love my dating analogies. Matt squirms sometimes when I do this, but um, you're watching a movie and there's a bar full of women and a guy walks in and says, I'll take anybody. We're all gonna laugh at that movie, right? We know that that guy's gonna walk out alone <laughs> if, if people don't throw stuff at him. So that's what you're doing. If you try to market to everybody, that's what you're doing. You could almost insult everybody. Um, so never, ever, ever wanna do that. We wanna narrow, narrow, narrow. Now, let me make another point. Once you narrow down, this narrowing that I'm speaking of, it's not, to, uh, it's not that you would turn away other people if they came to your business. Like if you're targeting this one narrow target and somebody out here comes to your business, of course you're gonna take their money and sell to them. But what it enables you to do is target the message and really say what needs to be say, said in the way that it needs to be said and, and at the time and place it needs to be said. Will that resonate with other people potentially? Sure. But if you don't narrow it down and nail it down, then you're just doing it all however you feel like doing it. Hopefully that makes sense. Mm -hmm. If Eric, if I could jump in to give an example that kind of sandwiches our market analysis and why it's so important and the target market, I'm thinking of the company with, we worked with um, years ago that wanted to open up that soul food restaurant. Mm. So we, we had this gentleman come to us, great idea, mama's recipes, wanted to share it to the world. He's from Connecticut and he chose this town, New Britain, Connecticut to open up a soul food restaurant. And if anybody is, understands the demographics of New Britain, I didn't even have to research it because I knew New Britain is a very, very heavy populated Polish community. A lot of white people, a lot of Polish people in New Britain, Connecticut. And he wanted to open up a soul food restaurant there. So for one thing, he didn't do his market analysis. He didn't understand the industry of the actual town he had chosen to create his restaurant idea. He didn't do his market analysis with what kind of food would that area like. 
He didn't do his market analysis to understand how is traffic driven to a restaurant when it's in its opening days? Is it foot traffic? Is it digital traffic? Is it advertising that he needs to do? How are people going to know he's in New Britain if all the people passing by don't really have a palate for soul food? Or if they do, it's, it's a smaller market of them in that area. Um, so he, he had a target market in mind, but his target market, as Eric said, was um, it was, it was dreamlike that if he opened a restaurant, everybody would come. And that's not the case for any business. It's not the case for Coca-Cola. It's not the case for, um, for Apple um, uh, 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 cell phones. It's not the case for any huge business. There's people that choose Walgreens over Rite Aid. There's people that choose Target over Walmart. And there's people that are going to choose Android over Apple. So for him to understand his target market in order to build the rest of his business around it, including the location, would have made him more viable and more profitable. So going into that study with him, we instead asked him to, instead of putting his business in New Britain, to move it to a market in an area and a demographic, which, has, which ac actually was near college with a larger plethora of um, ethnicities and nationalities rather than just a primarily Polish area, which was so ironic that New Britain, Connecticut was, um, was that that um, nationality. So that is part of market analysis. That is part of defining your target market and being able to make your, your, um, your business to a degree adaptable, but at the same time, having your business and defining that target market so everything else is able to um, complement that, as Eric is saying. Yeah, it's a great example, Martina. Um, and I'll bring this to another level um, twice here. Uh, could you could you market um, a soul food business to um, and and in marketing we have to stereotype to a certain degree. Like that's what we're trying to do, right? We've been taught as kids that's a terrible thing to do, but um, they exist for a reason, and we need to identify those stereotypes as a marketing company. That's part of target marketing. So. Could you market a soul food restaurant as a cool, hip new thing to a, a white community? Sure, like that might actually fly. But a Polish community that already has, um, already, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, when a community or, a, or, a, or an ethnicity, has, the culture is the word I'm looking for, that has a culture that's so rooted in a particular kind of food Mm -hmm. in a particular way to try to sell them um, on it, that's a tough road to hoe and you need mm -hmm. to understand that. So, yeah. And just, so, just so everybody, it, it was an immigrant Polish community. So these are people <laughs> directly from, it's not just people that have been raised in America. So that's why we directed him to stay away from New Britain because foot traffic would not be his, his friend. Yeah. So the next bullet here on our slide, um, we'll take this to, to the second other level here that I was talking about, is that targeting or segmenting these people means you'll be able to build your business for the right audience, efficiently using your resources to impress and attract your potential customers. So the main thing I want you to get out of that is that is segmenting. So in the beginning of this target market thing, I've been kind of making it sound like you need to narrow it down to one target market. You don't have to have one target market. You could have multiple target markets, but you need to treat them all special. You need to treat the messaging for all of them differently. So here's a perfect example. We do a lot of work with nonprofits and nonprofits in order for them to survive, they need to get money from everybody as, as much as possible, right? Do they want to narrow down, as I keep preaching to you, narrow down the people that are open to giving psychologically? Of course. Do they want to target people that maybe have more money so that they'll give more money? Of course, but they kind of have to go after multiple generations. So what we typically will end up, the biggest piece of gold that we typically give to nonprofits, and this goes for restaurants and any business that, that multiple generations would use or buy from, 
you need to understand those generations. You need to communicate to those generations differently. Now, you never want to spread too far. So if you're like a hip beer garden in Brooklyn that is really, really targeting millennials, right? Maybe you could, you could target as a separate target market. You could go after like um, some gen, gen Xers that might cross over a little bit and message them a little differently. But to go after boomers or the aging population, probably be super difficult because they're, they're likely psychologically, psychographically turned off by the whole super hip millennial beer garden thing. They, they probably think it's dopey or dorky or whatever they feel. So, so you, gotta, you gotta be careful and understand which ones you can go after. Um, third bu bullet, establish a need for your product or service, focusing on what problem it can solve. Gonna use restaurants again, right? or non-essentials, um, and I hate to use that term in this COVID time, but it's not essential for people to go to a restaurant. It's not essential for people to go buy flowers. It's not essential for people to walk into a, a high-end clothing store on Main Street in Montgomery, right? It, none of that is essential. So how do, you, how do you establish a need for a product or service that people don't really have a need for? Interesting question, right? So we'll use restaurants again, because it's just so easy for people to digest that as an example. Digest, get it? A little bad humor from Eric there. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a very interesting concept. Most people think that restaurants um, and bars and places like that, most people think the number one reason that people go to those places um, and those places would, would be successful. Let me be clear. The number one reason that those places are successful is because of the food. And that's, that's a huge misconception. And don't get me wrong, the food has to be good, right? The food or drink or whatever you're going there has to be, has to be good. You can't serve bad food or have cockroaches running around. There's a certain base level that everyone expects. But the reason that a restaurant or a bar or a social place goes from just existing to being very successful is because they, they provide something that the people that go there need more than food. So um, an environment, so friendship, um, a place to go where Everybody makes you feel like a king or a queen. That's a need. People have that need. People need to be liked. People need to be loved. People need social interaction. These are actual needs. They need food, but they don't need to go to a restaurant to get it. But to get love and human interaction and stuff, they might need to go to a restaurant to get that. Does that make sense? So you really, if you focus on the need that you're actually providing, and if you also think about some of the places that you really like to go and you really like to hang out, sure, they might have your favorite dessert or your favorite dish, but I guarantee you that there's another aspect of it that you might not even realize that makes you feel really good when you're there and wanting to hang out. And that is a need that that place is solving for you emotionally. If you can tap into that, as a restaurant or even a flower shop or a dress shop or a jewelry shop or something to that extent, if you can tap into the need that you're solving for your perfect target market client, other than just providing them your product or service, that is what's going to make you not just exist, but be successful. And that's what we're trying to go for here. So um, fourth bullet, you want to refine this target market, and here's one of the easiest ways to do it. Identify who has bought your product or service already. So how do you do all this, right? There's, there's a lot of stuff that we could tell you how to do right now that you'd still, your head would still be spinning. Um, it's a lot of like research on the internet and demographics and stuff that we're not going to get into. But you can just look at your, your current customers. And let me re revise that a little bit. Look at your most perfect customers. So if you have a hundred customers, 
or let's say you can think of 50 customers or even 20 customers right now, narrow that down to your best customer, your perfect customer. So if you're a restaurant, it's the person that comes once or twice a week. If you are an insurance person um, or, or a car salesman or a contractor, it's the person that asked you to come give them a quote and you gave them a quote and they said, okay, and wrote you a check, <laughs> right? They didn't argue with you about price. And then you got done doing the work and they were like, that was awesome. I love you did everything perfect. That's the client I'm talking about. Think about those clients and try to identify what, what is special about them. Try to stereotype them. Try to figure out, go ahead. Do you remember the client you researched for, um, it was like a water bottle out in Washington, Oregon? Oh, yes. Yeah. You want me to tell the story or are you going to? Yeah, you know it better. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we, um, we did this research for a company that makes uh, water bottles, right? So it's like some sort of specialty water bottle drink or something special and unique about it. Right. So the special uniqueness about this bottle was it made out of glass. Yeah. Right. So the company's called Love Bottle. This was back in 2012, I think we did this research. So everybody's heard you're not supposed to necessarily drink out of plastic, right? Because the BPAs can leak into the water and even metal, um, the metal particles or whatever can allegedly leak into the water as well. So the only thing that is truly allegedly, I don't know the science behind all this, that's allegedly 100% safe to drink out of is glass. So that was, that was her big focus, right? So when we started to dig into her core, her core, perfect, absolutely perfect target market, what we found out was it was literally survivors. It was literally, they, were, they tended to be female, um, skewed female, and there were women who had, had cancer. Um, uh, I think like two thirds of the ones that we had actually identified and started to dig into um, had, had like died and come back. I'm not even joking. Like some of them had actually died and been resuscitated. They were uh, the exaggerated, perfect core market for her. Why? Because they were so, so obsessed and focused with not dying again, that everything that they touched, anything they put in their body had to be perfect. Like that person would never smoke, right? Clearly, but they wouldn't even drink out of a metal or plastic bottle. So once we identified that, here's the power. I'm so glad you brought that up, Martina, because like, why does any of this matter? Some of you are getting it, but some of you are like, you're making my head spin. If, because we identified that, that those survivors were the perfect core market for this bottle company, and they were a startup as well. So they needed to make every marketing dollar count. They couldn't just blow money. They had to be super careful. It was being funded by Mina, the woman who owned the company. We found um, a couple of magazines that <clears throat> whose target market was survivors. So guess what? Instead of wasting our time on social media and posting stuff on Facebook every day and spending tons of money on TV or billboards or radio or God knows what else, we took out a couple little ads in these two national magazines that focused on survivors. Super cheap, and bam, you could not have gone after your most perfect target market ever. That's, that's what you're shooting for. <laughs> and, and hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at time here, I think, because this is a really important start, but I think we can go to the next one. So consumer behavior. Consumer behavior is a study of how people spend their money. Um, to understand your consumer's behavior and to learn more about your buyer's persona, consider the answers to these questions. How do your customers feel about certain brands or products? And, and you might be thinking, I don't know. I don't know what my customers think about certain brands or products. Well, ask them. Ask them. 
like it's free intelligence. You, you've probably heard, you probably heard the analogy or scenario or something where like the smartest people on the planet are the ones that just ask the most questions and read the most books and dig in the most. They talk the least and they listen the most. Like that's what you want to do. You want to ask them, find out like, Hey, do you eat at other restaurants? Like if you're at a rest, if you own a restaurant, they're sitting, the guys, are, people are sitting at the bar, come out from behind wherever you're at cooking or managing the business and walk behind the bar and say, and start up a conversation and say, Hey, do you guys go anywhere else? Oh yeah. We go here sometimes. Why do you go there? I guarantee you will learn something. Maybe it's just a new dish, right? That everybody likes and you get a new idea for a new dish, but guarantee you will learn something if you collect all this information. Um, and, and ask them, like, if they say they go to this other place, make sure you ask why, like, why do you, why do you go there? Oh, we, we, we love the bar there. Why be a little kid. Why do you love the bar there? It's really comfortable. Why, why is it really comfortable? Um, I don't know. We just feel really good there. My wife and I go there and we can just hang out for hours. Why? Is it because there's a fireplace? Is it because the chairs are comfortable? Like that person might not know why. So that's why you keep asking them because they might have to search in their brain and understand emotionally why they go there. But I guarantee you, going back to my, my first slide, it will come down to, um, where's, my, where's my need? Oh, my first bullet. It will come down to an emotional need. Everything does at some point in time. If you ask enough whys about why they go to that bar, eventually you're gonna find out that it's because their friends go there or because the bartender makes them feel really good or loved or wanted or, or cared for. That, that's gonna be the why. Um, so um, do people prefer to shop online? These are just a couple of questions. You just could ask anything. It depends on what kind of business you were. We're tailoring this to everything, right? Um, you want to ask as many questions as you can of them to try to understand their behavior and why they make the decisions that they make. And the easiest way for a small business to do is just ask. Um, you can do a survey and ask these questions. Um, you would have to do the why, 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 why to drill down because you don't want people to just answer how they want to answer. So you have to be very careful how you craft a survey. Um, but those are, those can give you a lot of information. Any, any comments on consumer behavior, Martina, before I move on? Yeah. I mean, it could be, um, asking questions like this could be as casual as putting up something clever and funny on a social media site where people can easily just like on Instagram, you can have those choices, um, you can choose and then it pulls it for you. Um, it can be as casual or even as professional as actually calling people and saying there's a purpose to these questions. But consumers, we live in a world where people want to interact with business owners. They don't, they like that. So this isn't, um, this isn't something that's going against the tide to, to what's trending right now in business. Awesome. Uh, SWOT analysis. Um, I'm sure everybody has heard this term at some point in their lives. I'm gonna, I'm gonna decode this for you uh, in two seconds and also give you the biggest mistake that people make when they do a SWOT analysis. So the decoding is to break, break it in half. So strengths and weaknesses are internal and opportunities and threats are external. So when you look at strengths and weaknesses, if you're a solopreneur, you're looking at the strengths and weaknesses of you, okay? And you need to assess that. If you're a restaurant, what are the strengths and weaknesses of your restaurant? And like really, really step back and look at it. If you're a main street business and you're really trying to identify the strengths and weaknesses of your business, here's the big tip. Most people focus on strengths most and, and opportunities. I'll get to the outside in a second. But it's the weaknesses and the threats that have the improvement opportunities. So here's a great example. 
very, very typical for uh, walk-in businesses of every type, restaurants, hair salons, um, uh, anything, Tro trophy shops, dress shops, jewelry shops, florists, any, any walk-in business. Here is something that happens so often, especially the smaller they are. Um, the owners and the decision makers walk into that business every single day and sometimes multiple times a day. And sometimes they walk in the back door. So guess what? The front entrance looks like crap. And they don't even know. They're not even paying attention. So that's a great place to start with strengths and weaknesses if you have a walk-in business. Walk into your business, the front door, pull into the parking lot like a client would, a customer would, walk up, to the front like a customer or client would, walk in the door like a customer or client would, use the bathroom that the client or customer would use, sit in a bar stool or sit in the hair cutter's chair or sit, make believe you're a customer and try to find, be a critic, walk in and try to find all the things that are wrong with that place. I guarantee you, you will, you'll walk away and go, oh my God, I can't believe people come in here. Not all of you, of course, right? But when you really start looking around, you're, you're going to notice how dirty your floor is and how worn it is. And you're going to notice that the, the second step to the entrance of your building is about to break. <laughs> Stuff that you would never notice. And then, mm -hmm. go ahead, Martina. Well, the, the same thing goes for an e-commerce website or, um, or a, a company that just completely relies on their website. You know, how user-friendly is it? Is it easy to navigate? Can I find my information by the statistical um, like 0.8 seconds? Like, can I quickly figure out without even thinking? Like um, uh, essentially a website is a maze and you should make it as easily navigatable, navigational <laughs> as Nav possible. Navigable. Navigable, <laughs> make up a word. Um, as easy to navigate as possible, so that anybody that goes onto that website knows exactly which pathway you want them to take to get to a shopping cart to purchase something. And it goes along with a brick and mortar store. You should be able to plan out your floor plan, your, um, your layout, your, your product displays in a way that it'll slowly navigate them towards the cash register without clutter and without clutter on a website, even social media, um, even social media, people will get turned off by the content of someone's social media because it doesn't have anything to do with the customer. It doesn't even think about the customer or the client. So anyway, that's kind of off topic with strengths, but same, same line. No, that's, that is, I'm, I'm super glad that you said that because I've been kind of stuck on Main Street. So thank you for, for broaden me, broadening me back out. Um, what Martina says is so, so true. We, there are some clients that come to us and they say, Hey, we want to give you $10,000 a month to do social media and Google advertising for us. And we analyze their website and we come back and say, uh, we could take your money, but, um, anybody that we drive to your website, your website is broken in 18 different ways. You know, like, look, have you clicked here on your website? If you click here, it goes to a template <laughs> like your web developer forgot to do that page. Um, we find stuff like that. Right. And, and when people go on your website, they're already going to your website for a reason. They're already typically looking for you or clicked an ad or saw you on Facebook or whatever the case may be. So like they need to get, they need to know that they did two things. They need to know that they got to the right place immediately. So if they have to figure out what you do, if it's not clear right away above the fold on the homepage, some way in your messaging, what you do, and they have to figure it out, that that's, they're going to, they're going to leave. You know, their detention span is so quick. The other reason they might be going there just to figure out how to get a hold of you. So like these websites where 
if they want to call you or they want to email you and they got to scroll all the way down to the bottom or God forbid, click on contact us and then dig around through contact us to try to find a way to get you um, is terrible. People are like, never mind. There's 16 other websites I could go to to do this. Um, one of my favorites, one of my least favorites, I'm being sarcastic, are these, these contact forms. So somebody literally goes to contact us because they want to talk to you about giving you their business and you make them fill out this stupid thing. Like they can't just email you. They have to put in their name and their email and write you a whole comment section. That's terrible, terrible. People hate that. So um, anyway, um, getting back, get me a little excited here. See, Martina told me I shouldn't be sitting back. I should be sitting up, but now I'm animated. <laughs> um, okay. So, so the strengths and weaknesses are, uh, are really important. And, and the reason I say focus on the weaknesses, again, I'm repeating, is that that's where the improvement opportunities are. Like, who cares about your strengths? They're your strengths. They're already there, right? That's great. If you're a, if you're a baseball player and you can bat really well, then who cares? You can bat really well. Fantastic. But if you can't catch, <laughs> it's an area you need to work on. So, or throw, right? Um, so, opportunities and threats are external is the easiest way to think about that. So, what opportunities are out there for you? And what threats are out there for you? So um, that's another one, right? The opportunities, the real value. There's value in both of those. But, and, and I almost, um, I'm going to flip on you a little bit because opportunities are things that people don't tend to look for, right? I don't want you to get overly concerned with threats because that could be a hole that you could go down that no good could come from it. Um, we do a lot of work with startups and somebody will come up with a new business idea and they're afraid to like, <laughs> they're afraid to put it out there because somebody's going to steal it. And we're like, well, if you don't put it out there, nobody's going to buy it either. So you got to kind of like let go of your fears a little bit. Um, but opportunities are something that's like really difficult to try to think about, but, and you have to spend time. You really have to sit down and focus on it and try to find opportunities that you can exploit to your advantage. And, um, and that's really, I'm glad we use that terminology. If you look at opportunities at the bottom, it says exploit to its advantage. You should think of it that way. You should really be in a Machiavellian state of mind. And, and Machiavellian means um, that you're looking to finagle the situation to your benefit. Nobody wants to be called Machiavellian as a, as a human being, but when you're looking and doing a SWOT analysis for opportunities, you want to be Machiavellian. You want to be like, what opportunities are out there? What things can I take advantage of for my benefit? Mm -hmm. Most businesses are helping other people by virtue of what they provide. So you being Machiavellian and figuring out an opportunity that you can exploit to your advantage is ultimately going to serve your clients anyway. And, you, and, your, and, your, and your customers. Hopefully that makes sense. This one is, is awesome. And um, we're amazed consistently at how, how often this gets blown off. <laughs> so uh, historical results are an, an immense amount of intelligence for you. But most people don't track them. So we'll give you the easiest, there's a two-step process to do this at home, uh, as easy as you can without hiring somebody. Uh, number one is make a list of all the things that you have done from a marketing perspective. If you've done radio, put that on the list. If you've done some kind of promotional items, put that on the list, put everything on the list. Um, a website, just want to let everybody know if you just build a website that's like building a building that's not marketing um, uh, site engine optimization if you're doing it ongoing can be a way to drive organic traffic to your website that might drive a sale so that would be marketing so think about that if you've done SEO if you've done Google Ads all those things make a list and then um, 
try to determine if you've gotten any customers or clients from those things. And some of you might say, well, how would I know that? Well, one of the first things you should get in the habit of doing if you haven't already done it is asking again, asking. So again, I'll use a restaurant, hair salon, doesn't matter. Somebody walks into your business that you've never seen before, mm -hmm. ask them, Oh, hi, nice to meet you. Glad you're here for your appointment. We see you're new. Hey, how'd you find out about us? Mm -hmm. Super simple, right? Mm -hmm. Um, if you get into like some digital marketing and stuff, there's results out there, mm -hmm. but, but be careful. Cause here's another thing that happens out there that drives us crazy. Um, if you've done any kind of social media or SEO or Google advertising or anything, there's tons of statistics out there. And even if you've hired somebody, they'll hit you with all these statistics. Well, unless you interpret those statistics and use those statistics to refine what you're doing via those digital means to bring a customer in, they don't matter. So the fact that somebody comes to you and says, Oh, uh, you used to get five visitors a week to your Facebook page. And with all the advertising we just did, you're getting 50 and nobody knew is coming into your business. Uh, who cares? <laughs> they're, they're not converting to a customer. So it's completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. What that number is good for is for the person who's paying attention to those uh, those statistics that it went from five to 50 and that it's not converting to use the information I just said to you went from five to 50, but not converting Oh, I should change something. Something's wrong. Something's missing. Let me use that to refine what I'm doing. That's what that information is good for. But at the end of the day, you really need to know um, why people are coming into your business. So that's the first step you you might be surprised at how many people um, have come in under what different tactics that you have tried. Um, you might be surprised. Here's the second piece, very important part of the puzzle. You can't do one without the other. You need to identify the lifetime value of a customer or client. Um, it's a little easier than it seems. It's a little bit of math. But um, think about if I'll use a restaurant again, this one, this one's actually kind of hard, right? So you're a restaurant and, and figure out how many meals a week you serve or a month, let's say, and to how many people. And, and literally you can just, you can just divide it and do the math and say, okay, a lifetime value of an average customer an average customer, not my best customer that comes once a week or twice a week, an average customer comes to my restaurant twice a year. Mm -hmm. And the average ticket for a sale in my restaurant with dinner and drinks or lunch and drinks, if you do lunch, you got averages of two, right? So if your average ticket for lunch is 30 and your average ticket for dinner is 60, then you've got to average it at, at 50. So they come twice a year, at 50 bucks. Now you know that a year value of a customer is a hundred bucks. Pretty simple, right? Mm -hmm. Lifetime value in a restaurant, different industries might differ, but just use your head, right? How long would the average person come to your restaurant before something changes? Five years probably before they move or they have a kid and they can't eat out anymore or your ownership changes or your menu changes or something. So that's just a quick way to think about it. Um, other businesses might have a much higher. Now that you know what that is, um, you might realize that, that one of those tactics worked better than the other one, even though it got less people. So there was, um, we did one not too long ago for, um, and for, for protecting the, the um the company we don't say we don't normally say our names of the companies we work with but it was a um, an auto repair shop a collision shop anyway we found a statistic and you you don't know you don't always find a statistic for your industry but it was great that we found one for auto repair um statistically 
a person visits a collision shop every 17.9 years. So it's pretty interesting. You know, if someone lives 60 years old, they have 40 years of driving experience or 70 or 80 years old, they'll probably have a collision maybe three times in their life, statistically speaking. So, and then we, from a historical analysis, trying to understand what they have done. So we have a whole list of everything they've ever done historically in marketing. And then we have our target market audience. So basically anybody that could be in an accident, but primarily within that location. So there's a, there's a mileage radius. Um, and then there's also the market analysis. Well, how do people find out about a repair shop or a collision shop? How do they find out? Number one way is word of mouth. Okay, so now we have word of mouth. Now we have the location in the area because we did our target market analysis. We know the types of people that are coming. Um, and now we have their historical results. Well, you know what was missing in that entire piece when we looked at everything from a thousand foot view and from a 360 perspective is that they were not targeting their current clientele that have utilized their services. Word of mouth is the strongest thing. They should be going back to those people that have an accident every 17.9 years and just sending them a thank you card something to get in the back of their minds. Like I had an awesome experience at this collision shop. Oh, my daughter got in an accident. You should go there. Or my friend got in an accident. You should go there. So that was one aspect. And the other target um, the other market analysis, the consumer behavior that we found out um, when you when you're in your twenties or in your teens and you need, you get in an accident, who are you going to ask? You're going to ask your dad or grandpa. You're going to ask a dude. Or you're going to ask your best friend's 40-year-old, 45-year-old dad who seems to have everything know, and they all have, well, I have a guy. I have a guy you can go see. I have a guy. So taking all of that and creating a marketing plan for them um, that specifically went to past clients. It's almost like ignore new clients, target your current clientele. They're the ones that are going to speak for you. Word of mouth strongest by far marketing um, channel to go through. And they were gonna tap into it with the strategies we created. So you can see how historical results and seeing how, how analyzing what they were doing and there was nothing tying their current clients, very little of anything, so. Yeah, it's a brilliant, brilliant example. Mm -hmm. um, I'll throw another quick one out. We had somebody, I, I got to keep the details down, but um, we have a client that uh, that did something that cost, uh, let's say, five thousand dollars, and they thought it didn't work. Um, but they got uh, one and a half sales out of it, but their average lifetime value was about a quarter million. <laughs> so, so it was very successful, uh, even though it only got one and a half people. You would think that wasn't worth it, but five grand equaled over $250,000. Um, all right. Macro environment. What a perfect thing to talk about right now. So <laughs> most people don't understand this. We try to explain it to them, right? So macro environment is understanding any major external or uncontrollable factor that might influence uh, an organization's decision making or its performance and strategies, right? Well, we are in one right now, kids, right? That's the whole reason we're talking is that the macro environment is an external uncontrollable thing that is affecting us right now from um, an, I guess, ecological, um, I guess is the real main thing that's happening right now if you talk about like uh, avoiding COVID, but the political environment that we're in right now, and of course the economic environment that we're in right now. So before COVID, we would have pointed to political as a macro environment, right? We're in a very, very, very polarized economic um, macro environment right now, and that could affect your business. You know, no time before could you, if you say something that's considered left or right, you could have a customer in your, in your restaurant, as I keep using that example, be offended like that, that, that didn't exist so much in, in prior. And I say prior, I say 10 years ago, I'm not necessarily talking about the current president because the president before that was a little polarizing as well. 
So you need to be, you need to understand those macro environments and understand what's going on. Um, political, demographic, economic, socio-cultural, um, that could be um, any kind of, that's happening right now as well too, right? So there's a uprising in certain cultures um, that are happening. Um, COVID has identified a socio-cultural thing with um, people of color, African-Americans being more susceptible to COVID. So that's a macro environment thing. It's caused by the ecological, right? But technological forces always can be, can be there. So you need to understand this pretty well when you're, uh, when you're making any kind of marketing decisions. We're gonna save the rest for, uh, for the next time. We got a couple of minutes left. If anybody's got any questions, did anybody put any on there, Martina, or do we just wanna open it up? Uh, we can do, if anybody wants to say anything out loud, um, we've had a few people that had a run, but they really enjoyed the presentation. Um, anybody that have a question that they wanna just say out loud, or they can type it in? Yeah, you guys can just unmute yourselves and talk if you want. We don't have a um, hundred people on here, so go ahead. Yeah. And any any anything you want to talk about with relates to the last uh, the last two seminars or any other questions you might have. The one thing I'll say, hey, this is this is Matt Dorcas. Um, the one thing that I'll say that that we've been talking about last week and this week, and that we're going to continue to talk about is all this information allows you to make wise decisions when it comes to making decisions in your marketing, your advertising, in your PR, right? So you have a better chance at success. And that's, that's, the, that's the one thing that, that I always remind myself that when we're doing this for our clients is we wanna arm ourselves with the best weapons and the best tools when we go out there and fight the good fight. We want to do good for them. So yeah, that's the whole point. Yeah. Great. Great summary, Matt, of what, what all this is for. No doubt. Yep. And ob objectivity really does help when you're looking at your business, because as a business owner, you're invested in the company. You're looking at it through bias lenses. So taking a look at a presentation like this in a market analysis to be able to know how you can look at your business objectively and look at it so that you don't have anything invested, but all you want to do, your goal is to make it the best it can be. And sometimes it could be admitting that you did something wrong or that you could have done something better, but that's where the SWOT analysis comes into play where you can see the opportunity to be able to do something, make something better and, and, and propel yourself a little bit forward, but it's looking at it from an objective, unbiased lens to not to try not to have that emotional tie to the business for the moment that you're creating yourself, that market analysis, that target market, and all of that. So I think we did an excellent job if no one has questions. <laughs> I have a question. All right, Amy. Uh, it's Lori. Lori. Oh, Lori, I'm sorry. That's okay. On your very first slide, your phone number was half cut off. I couldn't see what it was. Could you please tell me what it is? The phone number. On the first slide. Our phone right. number, Matt. Give her our phone number. Hold That's on. the phone number. That's all I want. So it was it was Eric's phone number. If you want Eric's phone number, uh, you can also have my phone number, which is eight four five four three zero five two seven seven. And if you have uh, if you have a question, you can always email us. It's info at capacitymarketinginc.com. Thank you. Yeah, I'll type it into the conversation. I don't know if everybody knows how to use the chat capabilities on here. So I'll put their phone numbers in here. Um, and even if you wanted to bounce ideas off of us in a conversation on the phone, just to see if you're on the right track, that's absolutely welcome as well. Um, we're, in a, we're, we're in a macro environment right now where everyone is just clinging to be able to survive. So 
if we're not supporting the businesses, the small, the large businesses that are our clients or future potential clients or just people in the community, then we're not doing our job to be able to help ourselves grow in the future because we're dependent on you guys to, to, be, to be successful. And um, if we could give you guys advice or e even just help you be objective, that would be a really great opportunity. All right. Thank you all. And uh, we're going to do, we're going to pick up on this um, next Thursday at 11 will be the third one. And um, that's it. We'll see you then, hopefully. Make sure you register. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, thank guys. Thanks, Martina. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Matt.